It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I hope you've had a good day. You can be seated, everybody. Amen. You know, on a Wednesday night, you know, we've all worked and done what we've done. And so we get to this point, and sometimes you can really be tired. But I believe the Holy Spirit is going to refresh us tonight. I really do. Amen. So glad you're with us. Yeah, we really are. Of course, Wednesday night service here in church, so we always receive our regular Wednesday evening offering. Um, those of you that are watching, and we have people watching from all over, and we're very thankful that you're a part. We haven't put any pressure on you to give. That's strictly up to you. But we are grateful if you do. We want you to know that. But we believe God uh, blesses the giver. He says Amen. he does. And so we believe that because his word teaches it. And uh, some say, well, you don't give to get. Well, you don't necessarily, that's not your whole goal in giving. We give to worship the Lord. That's what we do. We're thankful for his goodness. And so we bring our tithes and offerings to him as worship. But we also, in uh, enlightened uh, ways we look at scripture, we know that giving does bring harvest. And so uh, we don't apologize for that. And so uh, we believe you can expect that. We really do. We believe you can expect what God's Word says. That's what faith is. Believing what God says, He's able also to perform. That's what Abraham uh, did, and God called it strong faith to believe what God had said. Mm -hmm. He was able also to perform. So we're going to yes. receive our offering, and, uh, and Norton tell us a little bit about how to do that. And you can give online, you can give through text, or you can mail in your gift. And you know, whatever you sow... That is what you're going to read. Amen. That's what the scripture exactly. says. Exactly. So we're going to pray over the offering. We're going to pray over the word and we'll get going. Father, we want to thank you for the wonderful opportunity that we've had tonight. We've already enjoyed being together. It's really been good so far. But we thank you that we can bring our tithes and offerings to you with worship and thankfulness in our yes. heart for the opportunity. And uh, we do ask you to bless the giver. I know some people, Lord, sometimes they give out of need. And we ask you to meet every need. You said you would. And we thank you, you do. And so we thank you for that in advance. We also, as we approach your word, we ask you for utterance. We ask you for a mouth to speak and we ask you for ears to hear. Mm -hmm. We ask you by your Holy Spirit to take us to the place tonight you'd have us go and lead us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. We've been talking to you now. We've uh, done a number of sessions on the authority of the believer here in the church. We're going to continue on with that theme tonight. And we're going to go, um, we're, we're going to go back over some territory we've covered. But one of the reasons I want to go over is not so much um, just to be repetitive, but to give us a little more time to dig in, and scratch in it a little deeper. So we can look with a little more depth at some things that God wants us to see, because that's the way scripture is. The more you look at it, the more comes out of it. And I have never exhausted any verse of scripture. The more I look at it, the more I glean. The Bible says that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It has the ability to, to discern and, and divide asunder soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. The Bible is a living book. And the more you look at it, the more of God's life comes into you. The Bible tells us that Jesus, the word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. The very, uh, our Savior, the Lord, our, our Savior, He is a manifestation of the Word of God. The Bible calls Him in eternity past the Word of God. And that Word became flesh. The Word is that living expression of God. And when we bring the Word of God into our life, there's an element of the God life that comes into us. It, it begins to flow out of us. We begin to partake of something very, very, very supernatural. The Word is a supernatural book. It's not just a natural book. It's a supernatural book. And it does supernatural things in us when we look into it and delve into it. And so we're going to dig a little deeper tonight. Now we know back in uh, Genesis chapter 1, and we, we, we go through some things here that are just extremely important in the unfolding of creation. And I, I'd really, uh, I don't think I could do it justice, so I don't really want to dig too deep into it. But um, 
There's a whole lot took place before creation took place. When you see the Genesis account of creation, there are some things that happened before God said, let there be light and on and on and on. When God said, there, said, let there be light, he wasn't talking about the sun and he wasn't talking about light, maybe necessarily in the way we might think he would have been talking about light. He was really talking about the release of the energy that would allow the creation that he spoke into existence to happen. It was the energy behind that. Let there be light. That was necessary for the other things to follow. And then he said uh, certain things would produce and uh, he'd divide the waters from uh, the land and uh, he'd create uh, fish and birds and all sorts of things. But the energy force was that light force of God that, that allowed those things to happen. And so on the sixth day, we know that God created man and he created man to have dominion over the works of his hands. We know over here in the book of Psalms chapter eight, and this is a, this is a very, very important passage of scripture. No, I'm not going to go to that. I'm going to go back up here. I just get that prompt to go back to Genesis one. And let's go to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. Now there's a, if you notice, it says, let us make man in our image. It, he did not say, let, let me make man in my image. He didn't say that. He said, let, let us make man in our image. So it, right in the very beginning, God mentions the Trinity or the triune God, the plurality of God. God is one, but he's expressed in three different expressions, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So that's what the, we call that Holy Trinity, the Trinity of God. And it says, let us make man in our image. The image of God in man, man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. Now animals are not triune. They're dualistic. They have a soul and they have a body, but they do not have an eternal spirit. Animals do not. Man is the one that's created with that triune nature of God. The Bible talks about, um, it, it says with animals, the soul life is in the blood. And so it's, that's important to note. We don't have time to dig much there. But there is a plurality to God, and that plurality was passed on to man. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Now, man was created to have dominion. Now, that means authority. That's what that means. It means to, to be a ruler over or to actually take possession of. Mm. I, just, I keep being, getting prompted to go even back further than this. And uh, if I get there, I don't know if I'll get back out. That's why I'm hesitant to go. You know, but it says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And um, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so man is created to have dominion. He's, he's re, he was created to subdue the earth under God's watch care. He was, he was given that delegated authority by God. Now it called, Adam is called, if you see the genealogies even of Jesus, you see them in, in Mark and Luke, but you see how those genealogies go all the way back. And it, it talks about, it refers to Adam as the son of God. Now, Jesus, we know, is the son of God. We know that. But sometimes we forget that Adam was also a son of God. And he was created in a class to have dominion. He was created by God to be actually, for clarity's sake, to be an under God under God. He was created to be the God of this world. 
Now, when I say the God of this world, I'm talking about with a small g. He's not the creator God. He's not the almighty God. He's not the all-powerful God, not the all-knowing God. But he was created to, in this case, be the God of this world. Now, God is not bound by this world. We often uh, mistake, and there, there's a lot of things that we are, are limited to and by as human beings that we sometimes, because of our limits, we think God has similar limits. But he's the unlimited God. For example, uh, time. We're on what generally is referred to as linear time. We are in a, in a process of movement through time. We can't go back in time. We can't move perpendicular to time. Uh, we can't parallel time not without something happening. But God's not limited by that. Time is a creation of God. So therefore, he's not limited by time. He works in time as it relates to men, as it relates to humans, but he's not limited by it. It's a creation of God. We know that Jesus himself, referring to himself, he said, before Abraham was, I am. So he was present in the past when he said that. So he was not limited by the time that he was in. He had the ability to transcend time. You, you find him uh, getting on a boat with the disciples in the, in the Sea of Galilee, and they're, they're going to the other side. And when Jesus gets in the boat, the boat's immediately at the other side. So now whether it be by just a small space or whether it be by a huge space, that requires time travel to do that. Now, it might be a few seconds, a few minutes, or an hour or two. But nonetheless, it is, it is a jump in time. So, so Jesus had the ability to transcend time. Now, of course, he did it only as he chose to. And uh, you, you find him after the resurrection when he's in his glorified body. He appeared and disappeared. Well, the only way you can do that, that, that's quantum science. That's quantum physics is what that is. The ability to be here and instantly be there without lapse. See, we, we, we think movement is, we think the limit of movement is at the speed of light, but it isn't. It has to be faster than that. So the creator of light moves faster than light. You understand that? So he had the ability to move without delay or without lapse. That requires time travel. There's no other way around it. It requires it. So God is not limited by time. He works within time. It's the same with creation. God works inside his creation. We're inside his creation, but God's not limited by his creation. Creation is just that. It's a creation. It is not a confinement. God is what we refer to as extra creational. He, he, he's, he's beyond his creation. Creation is just this thing that he has. The universe is a thing to God, and he's bigger than it. He's not limited by it. He lives outside it as well as inside it. Now, you can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend that. But it's still the truth. And so when God told Adam, I give you dominion over this portion of what I own. And you take it and you subdue it. And you're the God over it. Dominion if you, if, you, if you think in these terms, if you think of the word kingdom, we, we use the word kingdom in relationship to the church or to the things that we know we got a coming kingdom. We know that, that what we refer to as the millennial kingdom. And uh, the Bible says the kingdom of God is within you. So we, we use the word kingdom a lot. Now, the word kingdom is actually the combination of two words. It's kings 
dominion. Okay, the king, of course, in our case, is God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. So it's the king's dominion. It is his domain. It's what he has authority over. When we work inside the kingdom of God, we work under the king's dominion. He's the king. We're not. Now we rule and reign with him. That's not fully expressed yet. It will be one day. But we have authority because he gives us authority. Now we're talking about the authority of the believer. And so we have authority because he gives it. Now we find that man was created in the image and likeness of God, that triune being, God being triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we being spirit, soul, and body. And then we find in Psalms chapter 8, he said in uh, verse number 3, he said, When I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? And that's a good question. And, and he said, When I consider the vastness of this creation that you put together, the question is, what is man? I mean, in, in relationship to all of this, what, what is man? Now, you see the creation of the animals, the horses, the giraffes and elephants, and you see the fish and the whales and the, all the things that are in the sea. You see the uh, magnificent birds that soar through the air, the eagles and all sorts of things. And then, you know, all these things are magnificent. But then the question is, what is man? Why are you so different with him? See, God breathed into man the breath of life. He breathed into man the very nature of himself. Now, that triune nature of man, there are three Greek words that primarily define it, a little bit, some variation on it. But your body is referred to as the soma. The soma is your, is your body. The soul of man is your suke. Now, when you put those two words together, you get suke, soma, or psychosomatic. That's what those two. You ever heard of anybody who has a psychosomatic illness? In other words, they think themselves into a sickness. They're sick. They, th they think they're sick. They become sick. Now that's scriptural, totally scriptural. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You'll become what you think on. That'll happen to you. You dwell on it, you think on it, you'll become that. Now that's a fact. Okay, so you got the soma, you got the suke, but then you got the other part of man. It's called the pneuma, and that, that word pneuma starts with a P, P-E-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. You, you understand that a little bit more when you think about a, a pneumatic tool. It's a, maybe a drill or a grinder or something you see in a garage, and they plug it into an air source, a compressor, and a hose. They plug it in. It's a pneumatic tool. It's run by air pressure. It doesn't have what we would call it. it doesn't have an electric motor. It's run by air. You, you hear about that word pneuma, you'll think about it a little bit when you think about um, pneumonia. If a person has pneumonia, they have a, a malady, something that affects their breathing or their breath. So when you think of pneuma, think of breath. When God breathed into man, the breath of life. He wasn't just blowing in his face. He was breathing into man himself. His very nature, his very, his very image of being, his very spirit he was placing in man. He put himself in there. He breathed into man the breath of life. The life of God is what causes a man to be alive. Nothing less. There's the life of the flesh. It expresses all the way through who we are, but it's really the life of God that makes us who we are. That pneuma of God, that breath of God that comes into us. And that's what this onlooker said. It was an angel that said, what is man? 
that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him. See, God didn't do that to any of the other animals. See, none of the other animals have a spirit. They have a soul, they have a body, but they don't have a spirit. What is man? What's the difference with man? Why is it so much different with him? Why are you taking such special care for man? That was the question. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now that word angels right there is the, the word Elohim, or it, it would really be better translated God. And it is that triune God that's mentioned that we saw back up there in, in Genesis uh, 1. He said, thou hast made him a little lower than God himself. So that's why man was created a little lower than God. Man was not created lower than the angels. Through what Adam did in giving his authority away to a fallen angel, man fell below angels, but he was not created below angels. He was created to be directly under God with God's dominion working through him. And he was given authority over this portion of God's creation that he said, that, that he should take dominion over and subdue it. And uh, it says, and he was crowned with glory and honor. Now glory is, um, the Bible says Jesus was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. It also says Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of God. So the glory of God is the Spirit of God. That's what it is. So God crowned him with his spirit and his very glory. That's an amazing thing, don't you think? It is amazing. It really, it really is. And, and glory and honor, and now made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands and has put all things under his feet. So God made man to have all of his whole creation under his feet. And that's, that's what... God intended. Now, we, we find that this happened, this changed in Genesis 3, um, verse number 1. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Now, if you notice, uh, there, there's a number of things here. This uh, serpent is a, a reference to the devil. And you'll find the devil is referred to in a number of ways in Scripture. He's not only referred to as a serpent. He's referred to as a dragon. He's referred to, well, you know, we know he's a fallen angel. We know that. So there's a number of references to Satan. But one of the things that God wanted us to see here is not so much the appearance, because we get all these images of Satan as a serpent. In other words, we, we see a snake, we see a cobra or something like that, and we think, well, that's an image of the devil. Well, it can represent him in, in his cunning and in his deadliness. But the Bible says that often Satan appears as an angel of light. He can be more beautiful than anything you can imagine. So it wasn't a snake that came to Eve in the fact of how you may think of this. This was a very beautiful creature that came to Eve, and it says he was more subtle than any other beast of the field. Now what that means, he's cunning, he's crafty, he's slick in his language, he's able to deceive. You see it today, guys. This is the ultimate con man right here. And you see these smooth talkers today, and they'll overthrow your faith if you let them. They'll do it to you the same way as it happened to Eve right here. Now, it may not, the stakes may not be quite as high because we're already falling. But the stakes were tremendous right here. And it says this so-called serpent. Now, again, I, I, believe, he, I believe he was beautiful. I don't believe... I don't believe it would have been a turnoff to look at him. But I believe he's slick, he's cunning, he's sly, he's crafty. And he comes as that angel of light. 
And it says he was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now see, that's always, uh, I, well, I won't say always, but many times that's one of the ways that God approaches us. Well, did God really mean that? I know, I know the Bible says that, but, but really, you know. Uh, don't you think it's time for an update on, on your views of certain issues? You know, it, the Bible's an old-fashioned book. It's a little old-fashioned. I don't, I don't think God, if he was writing this today, I don't think he would have said that. Oh, really? Well, see, you don't have a right to say that. And if you're toying with it, you're listening to the serpent. If you're getting ready to change the book, you're listening to that subtle voice. Same way you did. You don't have a right to change it. I don't have a right to change it. Well, I don't believe that's sin anymore. You really don't? Well, if God says it is, it is, since he's the one that is going to judge us ultimately. He's going to determine whether we is or ain't in the end of it, not us. Whether you get in or whether you don't. And since he's the one that has last right of refusal, I think you better listen to him. And you better form your life based on what he said, not what somebody told you or not what you think about it. See, that reasoning, that, that, that so-called, you know, the Bible talks about reasoning, how, how it can get you in so much trouble. And it can. You just have to cast down reasonings. You have to cast down all kinds of things. You have to believe the book. Well, I don't understand the book. Well, let's start understanding it then. I know there's a lot of things I see in Scripture I don't exactly understand it, but that doesn't stop me from trying to understand it. That's where you dig more. You look, you, you delve, and you, you, you do the things necessary. But uh, he got into some things here. He's, and uh, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit, uh, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not have e eat of it, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, God had told them, he said, he said, when you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, now see, this is where Satan got in here. But God, you know, God now, he, he's holding back on you. He, you, ought to, you ought to be able to know that. You, you, why, why, why should you be kept in the dark? You know, it, you need to know good and evil like anybody else. Because God knows, you know, if you eat it, you'll be like him. And, and you know, and he, he's just trying to hold back on you, trying to keep you deprived. Now, if they had put the devil, the serpent, the subtle one, if they had put him in his place, then, see, Jesus, Jesus, knew the difference between good and evil. Now remember, Jesus is called the last Adam. Okay? Jesus knew the difference between good and evil, and he didn't eat of the bad tree. So there's a way that they could have known the difference between good and evil if they'd have followed the leading of God. They'd have come right into an awareness of it without having to fall to find it out but they didn't do it that way. They broke the covenant with God. They broke commandment with God. They broke the relationship with God, and they did it. And they, they cost the human race everything, really. I mean, that's what, that's what all the pro problem is on the earth today. This right here started it all. Started it all. And uh, see, Eve kind of twisted the Bible a little bit too. He said... Uh, and she quoted God, verse number three. He said, but hath God said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. He didn't say that. He didn't say you can't touch it. He said, don't eat it. They could have touched it. They could have watered it. They could have groomed it. They could have, you know, done what they needed to to tend the garden because they were put in charge of it. But they just couldn't eat of it. So... A twist on God's word is what got her in this trouble. That's what not listening accurately can do to us today. 
we know half truths, we know semi truths, we know partial truths, and then we make our mistakes. We need to know what we're talking about, and know why we're talking about it. But often we don't. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So there it is. That's the lie, the satanic lie. For God doth know that in the day you eat of it, your, then your eyes will be opened and you shall be like God. You're going to be like him. He, he's, tra he's holding out on you. He's, he's really cheating you. Don't you feel left out that you can't enjoy sin just like these old sinners out here? Why don't you just go get to go into the world like they do? Why don't you go run around tonight and get you a few drinks and do some stuff? You know, just you, you've missed out on life. It won't hurt you. There you go. You, don't you feel deprived? You know, God knows if you, if you just, you know, have an affair. Just have an affair. You'll find out, you know, it's not that bad. No, it'll just kill you, that's all. It'll kill you. The wages of sin is death. We talked about this Sunday. The wages of sin is deadly. It's not the event that's coming at the end of life. When your physical life ends, that's death, yes. But there's a whole lot of death between here and there. And the wages of sin is deadly. It'll kill you all the way till it'll get you there. And then it'll really kill you. And if you let it, it'll take you to hell at the end of that. So it's really death. You know, that's why we've got to be careful with it. Amen? Mm -hmm. Praise God. So I want to I want to say something here. All right. I think in our world today, um, you know, we know that the majority really of Christians, so called, now whether they are or not, we don't know that, but uh, do not believe that the devil, Satan, is real. And well, so a, if you don't believe that he's that's real, a big mistake. how much <laughs> is he running over the lives mm -hmm. of God's people and they're unaware that they, you know, have any authority and that's what we're talking about tonight. The believer has authority. The believer has dominion that Jesus has given us, but we must know our enemy. We must know him. Now, we get to know Jesus, and we get to know our Father through the Word of God, but we can also understand his cunning, his craftiness, his strategies. He, uh, the enemy has a strategy. That's a plan. He has plans. And so what we have to do is use the Word of God to counter what the enemy wants to bring into our life. And I'm telling you, and I say this a lot, but you have to answer back. When the devil starts talking to you, you've got to answer back. Not just let that thought stay in your mind or stay, you know, just push it to the side. No, I don't receive that. I rebuke it. I reject that. I don't receive that thought. And you have to answer it back and then come back with the Word of God, what right. the Bible says, and let that be what's coming out of your mouth because we know it's a sword. It cuts up the enemy, the sword of the Spirit. His Word is a sword that cuts the enemy up and keeps him at bay. Whether You know, people may not know it, but he's getting away with a lot. And so, you know, when I started seeing this in the Scripture, it's, it's one of the things that radically changed my life. When I understood what the Word of God was for me, it's a treasure. It's a great treasure. And God has given it to us for this day and this hour to use it, and we can have victory. We don't have to be victims. We don't have right. to be victims. Right. We are victors through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you know, um, and, and you, you two, you, you, can, you can think this without even knowing Scripture. I mean, you could probably come to this conclusion. And it's an accurate one. 
God knows you better than you know you. After all, he did create you. And he made you and he put things in you that you haven't discovered yet. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you, your, your whole life is a continuation of discoveries, not just about things in life, but your, your life is a continual discovery of things in you. There's buried treasure in you mm. that you hadn't found yet. That's true. You know, when the scripture says to train up a child in a way he should go and when he's old and not depart from it. If you study that verse, what it means is it means to train up a child in accordance or in cooperation with his individual gift or bent. But it, the implication of it is, is you have to discover the bent. We try to vicariously live our lives through our children. We want to make them us or the thing that we wanted to be and are not able to do. Well, you know, dads will try to make a, a, you know, a pro athlete out of a son. Well, sometimes it works, but if they don't have a gift for it, you're just wasting your time. You know, sometimes, you know, the, the people try to become musicians. I know we did the lessons where our kids, you know, and it's like, that's a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> That ain't gonna work. <laughs> we we spent a lot of money and a lot of a lot of um, rubber on the tires doing this one, and it doesn't work. You know, they Lauren wanted to just go ride a horse or something. You know, that's what she did. I mean, she she'd never miss riding that horse, would she? Yeah, that's right. She had a she had a standing appointment every Monday. She'd go ride the horse. You know, they had a farm where you could do that, not far from us, and. She just loved to go ride the horse. Well, she, that's her. And she's just, she's an animal lover and has been an animal lover since she came into the world. That's just the way, way she's been. Well, you might as well cooperate with it because you're not going to get it out. But not only does God know you better than you know you, there's somebody else that knows you better than you know you. And it's that sneaky, subtle serpent <laughs> and he knows things about you that you don't know about you and he knows how to get you and i'm gonna tell you something about him he's playing a long game you think he's playing a short game he'll set you up if, if it might take him 20 years to get you but he'll do it if you let him now you don't have to let him but he'll play the long game on you i mean he'll set you up relationships various things he i mean he will do it and, and a lot of times you don't see the setup coming. You might even think it's the leading of the Lord. I just picked on you right then, didn't I? Well, God showed me this. Well, I don't know if it's God or not. You wait and see. Because in time, that'll, that'll pan. But you better give a little patience before you say God said. Because some of that stuff you think he said he wasn't saying. This God talking every 15 minutes, I mean, you know, God gave me a word. God showed me this. God, just stop. Give me a break. You know? I mean, I mean, your life is not that whimsical. If God is going to lead you in life, he's going to continue to lead you. I mean, that leading is going to be consistent. I remember when God was calling me to preach. I didn't even, I acted like I couldn't hear him. It wasn't any, it wasn't me, it wasn't my flesh doing that one. Because my flesh wanted anything but that one. And I mean, you, you went through it with me. It's like, I'm sure I was not the most pleasant <laughs> the moment well, in Well, I didn't want you to go in the ministry either. You, you know, know, it wasn't. <laughs> see, this woman you've given me, Lord. Uh, no, you have to understand I grew up no. in a pastor's home. Yeah, she, so, she knew she knew the reality of yes. it, you know. But it wasn't like we're looking for it. And then you, you continue to be drawn and you, you get to where you just can't, you can't not do it. You, you got to do it. And you, you don't want to tell God, you didn't really mean that, did you? You know, you try to talk him out of it and you try to do everything under the sun other than. Uh, but you can't avoid it. So this... Well, God told me I'm called in the ministry. I, he told me that about 15 minutes ago, so I'm, I'm going right now. That's not the way it works. It's that absolute knowing that you know, that you know, that you know. I know I'm called to preach better than I know my name. 
And I know my parents. I believe my parents. And they told me my name is what it was. And they told me I'm their son. They did tell me that. And I believe it. But I know I'm called to preach more than I know I'm their son. Because I got that one straight from heaven itself. There was no middleman in that in that one. <laughs> you know, no doubt about it. Well, you got to do it. But see, Satan he's a, he's a long game player, and and he'll 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 sidetrack you. He, if 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 the devil sees you with a call of any kind on your life, he one of the number one things he'll do. Is get you to marry the wrong person. You can never get past it. I mean, it's a ball and chain on your leg the rest of your life. You know? I mean, God put us together, and I didn't even know he was. No, I didn't know it either. I mean, really, I went to war to marry her. You know, the day I told you she was cute? She is. She's still cute. I mean, she's cute now. She's always been cute. But... I'm, I'm teasing you a little bit, but, but I mean, I, we have, we have talked about, it. we were kids, but don't tell me kids can't fall in love. You know, we're just kids, teenagers. And, uh, you know, we know we were Christians, not very good ones, but we, we had, we had done it. You understand what I'm talking about? And I, I know, I know, I got saved. I mean, there's not any question about that. I mean, there's not any question about. It. And so here you are. You're being led, but you don't even know you're being led. It, you, you, your leading is beyond your understanding. See, the Holy Spirit will lead you beyond your knowledge. That's right. For Guarantee sure. he, he, he will. And and he'll he'll he again. He knows you better than you know you. But if, if you're impulsive and you don't wait, now see, we were engaged. And I spent 13 months in Vietnam in a combat zone while we're engaged. And I went into the army so I could marry her to get that behind me. Now I'm telling you, it's crazy. And I'm not recommending anybody do it. But I did it, and it worked. And I believed I was led to do it. Really. It's either nuts or God. It's one of the two. And it proved to be God. But the point is, is, is if, if you have anything that resembles a call on your life, the devil will try to get you off of it. He'll, he'll try to get you away from it. And uh, you've you got to be careful with that. And that's why you have to walk through life kind of slow. You don't, you know, especially the big decisions of life. You don't, you don't do them on impulse. You let God establish it in you, and you make sure because the stakes and the consequences are far and away too high. Mm. Your whole future, not just till you die and go to heaven, because when you go to heaven, folks. The rewards that you've accumulated on this earth follow you. Right. So it's not just, oh, a little while. I mean, these are things that have eternal consequence. And, and now remember something about the devil. He's playing the long game. And he tempted Eve and she fell. The Bible says Adam was not deceived. He knew, he knew what he was doing. But now I believe, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. Adam, Jesus is called the second Adam. He's called the last Adam. So a lot of the characteristics of Adam were superimposed on Jesus and vice versa. You see a lot of the similar characteristics. Now, Jesus didn't fail. Adam did. Jesus was sinless. He carried out the will of the Father perfectly. Adam didn't. And so here you have this thing. I believe that if, if Adam had stopped this process when Satan tempted Eve and they partook of the fruit. Now, see, Adam was so in love with Eve that he did not feel like he could lose her. 
And so he was willing, and really, in essence, he worshiped her. That, that was the problem. Because when you worship something, you put it above God. That's what worship is. You put it above God. Now, God, I mean, I love Nora, but I don't worship Nora. Um, I hope Nora loves me. She tells me that sometimes, but um, I think she does. Um, but we've kind of got an understanding in our home that uh, Jesus is first. Right. I mean, I'm not, I'm not bothered that she's got another man ahead of me. You understand? Matter of fact, I believe her love for Jesus gives us a better relationship, not a worse one. Mm -hmm. See, so our relationship with the Lord is a priority. It's not a secondary thing. It's the number one thing. Everything else is second to that. Well, what Adam had allowed to, to, to happen to him is he had allowed his love for Eve to get ahead of his love for God. And so therefore he worshiped Eve rather than worship God. And he lost his whole estate. He lost his position. He lost his authority because he did it. And Satan became at that moment in time when, when Adam submitted his authority to Lucifer. Lucifer who became Satan. Lucifer fell and became Satan. And when Adam gave him that authority, he became the God of this world. He took Adam's position. That's why I said earlier that Adam was the God of this world because that's the exact badge when Satan got it from Adam. That's the exact badge that God put on Satan, called him the God of this world. And the way he got it was because he got it from Adam. That's how he got it. So when you say those words, you know, those, those can, can be shocking words to call Adam the, the, the God of this world. That's, that's a shock. Well, you can't call a man God. Well, you, you use a small g, but yeah, that's what he was. If you can call Satan God, I guarantee you can call a man God. You follow what I'm talking about? All right. But you see over here in Luke chapter 4, and this is a real interesting passage of Scripture. It goes a, a, to really to what you were saying earlier about taking the Word literally and, uh, and letting the word do your fighting for you. But now Jesus is just getting ready to go into his earthly ministry. And he's in the wilderness and he's on that 40 day fast. And we find over here that um, in verse number two of, of Luke four, it says, and being 40 days tempted of the devil, uh, you know, in that day he ate nothing and on and on and on. Um, and the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command these uh, stones that it be made bread. And so here we find Satan tempting him. Now there's three temptations of, of the devil here. And these three temptations deal with the three temptations that are common to man. The pride of life, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh. Those are the three common types of sin. And you hear, you know, it says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. That doesn't mean that every temptation that you had exactly, he had exactly the same temptation. Jesus wasn't tempted on I-40 in traffic. You get what I'm talking about? But the flow of what he, we deal with, he dealt with. He dealt with that. And so these three temptations of the devil represent those three major types of sin. All right. And we find down here that um, in verse number five, and it says, the devil taking him up to a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give unto thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me. See, Satan said this was delivered to me. Now that was Adam's authority delivered to Satan. And he goes on to say, 
and to whomsoever will, I give it. Now that's the same exact position that Adam was in. Unto whomsoever I will, I give it. Adam was in a position to give it away and did. You remember Esau? It says for a, for a, a mess of pottage, some soup. The Bible says he gave away his birthright. And it says that once he, later in life, when he just realized what he had done, the Bible says he sought it carefully with tears but could never get it back. See, there's some things that we flippantly give away that you never get back. Well, you know, the grace of God, I mean, you know, I know what God's got a plan B for me. You better take care of plan A. Because there's some things you're going to lose you may never get back. You may never get it back. I don't know if it's true, but there's some historical evidence that probably indicates it. You remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and Jesus said, go sell what you have, give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. That's exactly what he said to those other disciples that became apostles. Come and follow me. That's what he said to him. He said, come and follow me. Well, was he offering him, him apostleship? Well, he was offering him something. He said, come and follow me. And he went away sad and was grieved and couldn't do it. Now, history tells us, not the Bible, but history tells us in Acts chapter 4, you remember when Barnabas came and laid the money at the apostles' feet? Remember that? Historical record tells us that that was Barnabas. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But historical record tells us that was probably Barnabas. So here he did it, but he missed his opportunity to be drawn into that calling. He never got another opportunity for that. Now we do find later as Barnabas is an apostle, we do find that. But he was never, he was, he could have never been an apostle of the Lamb. He lost something. If all that history is correct, he lost something that he could never regain. Even though he did it, he did it later. And yes, he's blessed. And yes, I'm sure he's got great rewards in heaven. No question about that. But he lost something in God that he could never get back. And that's a, that's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. And so um, here we see that Satan comes to Jesus, the devil comes to Jesus and says, all these kingdoms have been delivered unto me and to whomever I will, I'll give it. And he said, if you'll bow down and you'll worship me, I'll give them to you. Now, Jesus knew the truth. And it says that he was tempted of the devil. This would not have been a legitimate temptation if Satan was lying. This was the absolute truth. These kingdoms were delivered unto him, which means if he was doing it with Adam's authority, these kingdoms should have been Adam's because he was doing it with Adam's authority. That's the authority of the believer, brother and sister. That's what God intended for us. But we blow it off and we, we, we don't... You know, and, and I was today... Um, just, you know, thinking about some of these things. And I really, really believe that the Lord really spoke to me about it. He said, you, he said, you don't really understand the importance of these lessons. He said, my, my body needs to get this. The day and hour that we live in right now, my body needs to understand this. And we do, my brother and sister. We need to know our position in Christ and in the name of Jesus, what he's given to us. Now, again, we're in this series and we're going we're gonna to explore some things. We're going to talk about authority over the devil. We're going to talk about that a little more. Um, actually, deliverance for, from demon power. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about maybe, maybe to a degree, the origin of demons, where they come from, who, what they are and all that. We, we may talk about that a little bit. I don't know how deep I'll go into that. 
Um, but we really have been given authority over the devil. Whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. So heaven's waiting on you to do something. And we're waiting on heaven to do something. See, we keep praying and God said, why don't you start doing? You're supposed to decree and declare if you're going to have. And we're praying for God to do something. He already did something. He already gave us authority over the devil. And we're begging him to do it. Well, Lord, get the devil. That's exactly what Paul did. You remember um, when that, it says there was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul. And uh, it says it was sent to buffet Paul because of the abundance of revelation that was on Paul. Now, I'll tell you something about Paul now. Do you remember when Moses went up on the mountain and... Uh, all that glory of God fell on him and the tables, the tablets were written by the finger of God. God appeared to him. He saw God's hinder parts and all that. I mean, it's a tremendous thing that happened. Tremendous, powerful thing. And then Moses came down from that and, and you know, uh, later he wrote what, what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which really was the marching orders for the whole Jewish nation. I mean, that, that was really what it all was. In Mount Sinai, the, the scripture tells us that Mount Sinai, where he went up, is in Arabia. It's not in Israel. It's in Arabia. All right? Now, do you remember Paul when he was getting the revelation from God? Remember that? And, and he said, I did not get this revelation from men he said, no man gave this to me. I got this directly from God. Now, I'm going to tell you, from Romans 1 to the last chapter in the book of Hebrews, that's what we refer to as the Pauline Revelation. That's what it's called. Now, you've got other epistles. You've got James and Peter and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You've got those. So all those epistles, are well, the, every, everything in the Bible is export, important. Don't misunderstand any of this. But I'm telling you, Paul's revelation to the church tells you who you are in Christ, what you can do through Christ, what God's done for you, what you can do for Him. It, 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 is, the, it is the revelation to the church about the church. The Gospels don't give it to you. The historical record of Jesus' ministry is fabulous and we need it, but it does not tell you what you got. It just doesn't reveal that. And even the other epistles that you find, you find Jude, you find, like I said, Peter. Peter himself referring to Paul said, these things are hard to understand, but it's scripture. That's what Peter said. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the one that had the revelation of the church. The important part of that is this. You don't know who you are, and you don't know what you can do, and you don't know what's available to you unless you know what Paul wrote. That's where you get it. And if you're going to live your life in portions of Scripture, and we all do, we got our favorites, you need to let Paul's epistles be your favorite part of the Bible. Now, you read the other. Don't misunderstand anything I'm saying here. But I'm telling you, if you live in, in Paul's epistles, you'll know how to live. And you'll know how to do it the right way. I'll guarantee you. Now, the interesting thing about Paul is this. Moses went to Arabia and ascended to Mount Sinai and got the revelation of God that created the Jewish nation. That's really what happened. All right. You know, Paul, when he got that revelation that he didn't receive from the other apostles, he came back later and talked to the other apostles about it. You remember he said, he said, I want to get, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, lest I've run in vain. Let's all get our heads together and make sure I'm preaching the same gospel you're preaching. But he said, I didn't get it from man. I got it directly from God. And you know where he got it? In Arabia. 
the same place that Moses got it. That's astounding to me. The revelation to the church. I wonder if it was Mount Sinai. I don't know that. But it's a lot to think about, isn't it? But that's where he got it. And these things that God has done for us, the God of the world, the, the, just like Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. In other words, what Satan always continues to do is to blind our minds and our eyes to truth. We desperately need the truth. This revelation of the authority of the believer is critical to the believer. Paul said, talking about that messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him because of the abundance of revelation that had come to That's why that messenger was sent. He sought God three times to take that from him. And God told him, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, see, sometimes we, we, we hear that interpreted as God saying, no, I'm not taking it from you. Live with it. But no, what he was saying, do you remember now grace is not just saving grace. You, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself is the gift of God. So there's saving grace. Fact. But you find there are grace gifts mentioned in the Bible. Paul talked about the grace that was on his life through his calling. He even told the Philippian believers, he said, you are partakers of my grace. So the grace was the empowerment of God for a person to do what they were called to do. That's what grace is. The empowerment of God to do what you're called to do. And when God said, my grace is sufficient, he said, Paul, I've given you authority over it. You're going to have to do it yourself. Because if you don't do it, he's not leaving you. And it is the same way today with us, my brother and sister. We are begging God to do for us what he's already entitled us to do for ourselves. If you don't tell the devil to get his hands off your money, he ain't getting his hand off your money. If you don't tell him to get his hands off of your life, he's not getting his hands off of your life. We're praying, oh God, get the devil off of you. He ain't getting the devil off of you. We're praying for things that we have got to stand our ground and take our authority for ourselves. We're living secondhand lives, second-rate lives, far, far, far below our privileges in God and asking God to bless us. Now, God wants to bless you, but you've got to do a little bit on your own. You've got to stop this. This outlaw running through your household, you've got to stop him. You've got to stop him. And it's high time by God to stop him. I'm not saying it the way I meant to say it. I mean, it's time to stop him. Instead of giving him authority to run through the house like he's a wild animal. And we step back on the couch and watch I Love Lucy reruns and say, oh, God, help me. And wonder why he doesn't. Go. <laughs> Go. <laughs> you know, um, you were talking about your call into the ministry. But, you know, every person God has given a call to. Right. And some people are called into the ministry, but some people aren't. But the scripture says, walk worthy of your vocation. And really what that means is your calling. Walk worthy of that calling. And, you know, discover what that is. Well, I know we, we have a lot of young people in church here and probably online that listen uh, to us online. And the thing about it is you have a calling and you can discover what that is. You don't have to be frustrated over it. You don't have to, 
you know, be scratching to find out what it is. If you live your life for the Lord, He'll give you indicators. He'll give you direction. And He'll give you guidance. And He'll get you on the right path. Because remember this, each and every one of us inside the calling that God has placed on our life, He's got people that He wants us to touch. He's got people that He wants us to talk with, to lead to the Lord, to be an influencer, to, to be there for them in their dark times when the enemy is trying to, to beat them in every direction. And, and if we will listen to the Holy Spirit, He will give us that guidance and that direction into the calling of the Lord. And so I think that's very important, you know, because a lot of people think, well, if I'm not called into the ministry, I don't have a call. Well, yes, you do. Everybody does. Each and every one of us, we have a call. And there's a purpose for us being here. Nobody came into this world and God did not have purpose for your life. He knew you before He formed you in your mother's womb. He knew you. You're not an accident. You're not here by happenstance. You're here on purpose. And you know, one of the things that I've always wanted to do with my life is, God, what is it that you have for me? I want to walk in that pathway. Of course, at my age right now, I feel like I do know what that right. is. But you know, a lot of young people, you start out, maybe you don't know. But you can know, and God wants you to know. And that's important. And this process of not letting the enemy dictate your life and what it is going to be. Well, this is, this is the way your family was. This is the way you're going to be. No, nope. no, 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 no. No. You might love your family, but you know there's issues there. So it doesn't have to be the same way for you because God gives you an authority through the name of Jesus to do what you need to do to get you to the point in life of your calling and your pathway for Him. Amen. And your giftings, whatever they are, and, and everybody's gifted differently. It's all a different package for each of us. But they completely, absolutely are consistent with your purpose. Mm -hmm. God has gifted you for your purpose. Yes. Now, you may have to discover some of that. You may have to go through some trial and error to find out. There, I remember kind of coming into some things where we found our calling. There were some things along the way that we did in church that I discovered I'm definitely not called to do that. <laughs> and uh, they were good things. They weren't bad things, and it wasn't like you didn't enjoy it, but you realize that's not what I'm called to do. And so you have to go through that discovery. You have to find you inside you. You have to find yourself. You just do. And, uh, and when you cooperate with you, you will uh, be happier with you. You need to get comfortable in your skin. That's pretty important. You know, all of these things that we're talking about tonight begin with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. None of it happens if you don't know the Lord. You have to know Him. And I don't mean know about Him. You have to know Him. Know Him in the depth of who He is. Know Him in the depth of who He wants to be in you. Allow Him to be to you what he wants to be. God wants to be as close to you as your own breath. That's what he wants. But you have to come to him. You have to come through the Son. You have to come in Jesus' name. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, I don't serve you. I repent of my sins. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for hearing me and receiving me. 
in Jesus' name. Now, you know, if you prayed a prayer like that, you'd never pray a prayer like that and not mean it far and away too serious. That's a sober prayer, but it's so important. Some of you may be returning to the Lord. Maybe you've already done that at some point in time in your life, but you've walked at a distance. If you're praying that prayer for the first time or if you're praying it to recommit your life, let us know. The reason it's important to let us know is because the Bible says if you're ashamed to confess him before men, he'll be ashamed to confess you before the Father and before the angels. You have to tell somebody. You can't just keep it to yourself. If there's a person close to you there where you're at, tell them. But even if you tell them, let us know too. If there's nobody there, then let us know because we want to pray with you. We want to rejoice with you. Now I want to say this to you we, because there are people who tune in from all over this nation to watch, to be with us. Get in a good church. Get in a church where you can grow and be a part of the yes. fellowship and the so family important. of God and hear the Bible preached and, and, and fall in love with, I'm, church is not perfect, but it's what we got. Because we're not perfect, you know? Get in church, get in a good one. Get in a place where you can put some roots down and enjoy your Christian life. You need it. You desperately need it. We'll be here, of course, for you. We'll be here Sunday at, at 1030. We'll be here again next week, same time. And uh, we appreciate you being a part. We know you don't have to, but we're glad you do, uh, aren't we? Yes, we are. And, you know, if you're in the Knoxville area, which I know many people aren't, so it might not apply to you about finding a church, but come and be with us here at Redemption. Mm -hmm. If you're from this area, we would love to have you and make sure you begin to read your Bible. So very mm -hmm. important. So very important. Let me just say a word about church, um, thinking about when you were talking about it. You know, we, you know, Knoxville is kind of a, you know, four-sided city. You got north, south, east, and west like most are, but it, Knoxville's a little different. The rivers and the highways make it a little more. If you if you west, you stay west. If you east, you stay east. That's kind of the way it stays. But drive a little bit if you need to. You need it in a church where you can grow. And if you have to drive a little bit to do it, do it. And come here. Because you'll grow here. And your life will stabilize. And I'm not just saying it. You say, well, are you plugging the church? Of course I am. Why would I not? <laughs> Amen. We're, I, like, I love our church. <laughs> you know. But we'd love you to be a part. So uh, why don't you bless everybody before we go? Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just reach out to our brothers and sisters in the Lord and all those that are listening, Father, in this room and online, and we pray the special blessing. Let your mercy and your kindness be manifested toward all those that are here tonight. Lord, there's some people that may be dealing with rejection. I thank you, Father, that these people know that they are accepted in the Beloved, in you, Lord, and manifest your presence and your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next time.